Good evening and welcome to the Ombudsman program. My name is Diane Wellborn and I am the Ombudsman and I'm also going to be your host for this evening's program. Tonight we have our topic as emergency preparedness in Montgomery County. Um, we're going to bring our viewers lots of information about um, about plans and about practices that are in place in the event of almost any kind of emergency. So I'm very, very pleased to have with me uh, tonight our Health Commissioner of Montgomery County, Jeff Cooper. Thank you for joining. It's a pleasure to be here, Diane. Thank Great. you. And I'm also glad to have with me Jeff Jordan, who is the Director of Emergency Management for Montgomery County. Hi, Dan. Great. So I think between the two of your departments, we can cover it all. Um, and so I want to remind the viewers, it is a call-in show, and so if anyone has a question uh, or comment, we, we welcome hearing those. But without further ado, we'll just dive right all in right. here. Okay. It must be really challenging for you all to have to manage plans for almost every eventuality. I mean, it's um, no matter what might come to our citizens here, you all, along with your partners, which we'll talk about later, are the ones that are going to um, protect us. So I know that's, um, that's, that's quite uh, a challenge. Let's start first with our nat nat natural, sorry, natural disasters. Okay. I mean, we have a river that can flood. We have streams that can flood. We've got um, ice storms that we've mm -hmm. all kind of lived through recently. Um, then there's always big winds and tornadoes. So all of these types of things, how are we prepared to help our citizens in the event of some of these issues? Well, our office and the emergency management system in Montgomery County takes an all hazards approach. So we have a comprehensive emergency operations plan for the county which really kind of organizes the support the county can provide to the first responders in the case of a large-scale uh, large event. Uh, when we do get a weather report that makes us think we may be looking at some um, natural um, uh, uh, hazards, uh, uh, we, the first thing we do is we reach out to our partners. The first thing we do is we reach out to our partners. We start um, uh, just making calls. Uh, we reach out to public health, the emergency planners, the Red Cross is an important partner, um, DPNL, RTA, whoever we think we're going to need probably in the next 24 hours, particularly if we have gotten a, an alert from the National Weather Service in Wilmington. And uh, we, one of our key partners is Skywarn, the weather spotters, um, and they give us eyes on uh, reports as a weather front comes through the county. Uh, 24 hours a day. So in the middle of the night, we'll be getting reports from them. And then we simply track it. A lot of times uh, watching uh, the local weather. Uh, local weather channels do a great job in uh, covering the weather fronts as they come through. And we, we track them as they go through. And hopefully they pass through without any major damage. But if they, if they do not, then we're ready uh, to follow up right away. Well, you mentioned these uh, storm trackers. Are mm -hmm. these... Um, are these individuals or are these machines somewhere that are? Out no, there? it's a, it's a it's a network of amateur radio operators okay. and they're weather spotters and they always stress they're not trackers. Sorry, they don't, they don't change that's, the that's storm. That's another TV show, yes, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. They they uh, they let the storm come to them, but then they provide uh, real time reports uh, both to our office and to the National Weather Service down in Wilmington, and they also give us a real good sense of a damage assessment right after the event. So we know if high winds have gone through, whether come morning we're going to be looking at some extensive damage or not. I see. And do you feel like that the weather uh, system is giving enough advance warning for us? I think so, yeah. The okay. National Weather Service does a great job. The, our partners down in Wilmington do a very good job in, in communicating and keeping us all in the loop. Um, and again, uh, frankly, one of the best sources of weather information is your local news station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's where you would suggest that people mm -hmm. oh, yeah. look at that. At we, we also suggest people get a NOAA weather radio. which NOAA. They can, NOAA. N-O-A? N-O-A-A. Okay. Weather radio. Uh, you can get it from any electronic shop, and it can be programmed to give you weather alerts only for your county. 
So you're not getting woken up in the middle of the night every time a wind goes through Cincinnati or something. Mm -hmm. But it will give you those critical information 24 hours a day. Okay, and good. Well, that's something people can take away and uh, think about in getting uh, for the future. Um, do we uh, still have tornado sirens? Some jurisdictions maintain tornado sirens or warning sirens. We like to call them warning sirens okay. because they're not necessarily just for tornadoes. The, the, key, yeah. the key when you hear a siren, go somewhere safe, get, in, get into shelter, and then again, turn on the media, find out what's going on. Um, tornado, or <laughs> now I'm doing it. Uh, warning sirens, there's not a one size fits all solution to notification, but sirens are one tool. Again, no weather radios are another. Um, apps on your phone or another. Um, the emergency alert system is another. Social media is another. So there's each community has to look at what's right for them, the right, right combination of technology. Right. I think the uh, scariest thought is perhaps something coming through in the middle of the night when everybody's sleeping. Sure. I mean, during the day, people are communicating back and forth with one another all the time. So um, what, what, what do you have to say about that, the nighttime? Well, again, you can get, uh, you can get alerts radio. on your phone, okay. and you can get the radio, and those are probably the two key things, and, and make sure that they are um, set so they will wake you up. Okay, very good advice. Thank you very much. And um, who else do you, uh, are there certain partners that you feel like you need to mention at, at, with the natural disasters? Well, again, we take an all-hazards approach, okay. so pretty much our partners for every incident are the same. We right. use them in, in somewhat different configurations. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the, the role of the county and the County Emergency Operations Center is to support the incident commander. So it's always the local jurisdiction that is in charge. Whether in, in many cases that's the fire department or the, the fire chief or a fire officer. In some cases it's law enforcement. But again, our job is logistics and communication to provide them the support they need. Okay. Yeah. And do you have a communication system that is in addition to our um, standard phone service? Um, are you? Do you all have good ways to get with oh, one sure. another if yeah. if the wind takes the phone out or whatever, you know, yeah. the tower goes down or what? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, a matter of fact, the, the, county, uh, the county and the city of Dayton are just coming to the end of a multi-year project of going to a digital 800 megahertz radio system okay. to connect the entire county. Um, up until now, radio systems were analog, using analog equipment. Mm -hmm. That equipment is being phased out by the manufacturers, and they're no longer being supported by spare parts in mm -hmm. a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And so we have gone to a digital system. Uh, we are going to be part of the MARCS, uh, which is the state radio system. And so we will be connected uh, not only within our county, but we will have uh, interoperable communication throughout the state. Great, great. Did you have anything to add on that particular? Sure, I'll, okay. I'll <laughs> add just a little bit. Okay, good. From a public health perspective, we certainly value our partnership with the Office of Emergency Management. We've been doing this type of planning together for, mm -hmm. for many years. Um, there are a few public health issues that may arise during a, a widespread or significant natural disaster. And so, for example, if we have loss of power, um, it may be that we would need to activate shelters uh, to especially care for um, individuals with functional needs that may not be able to, to, to stay in their home. So public health is actively involved in that type of planning. Uh, we need to still make sure that our food supply is safe. So uh, food service providers, uh, in the event that they lose power, there are certain things that they need to do to, to maintain the, uh, the safety of that food. Uh, if there's significant structural debris, there are obviously cleanup standards and potentially decontamination standards in the event that a building contains asbestos that, that we would need to monitor. So we see public health playing a, a very supportive role in working with the Office of Emergency Management and the other providers that, that are responding to the incident. Great. Well, thank you very much for bringing sure. us up to date on that. I'd like to move now to talk a little bit about you know, outbreaks of, of disease. I think that the um, current rise of the um, Zika, am I saying that? Zika, Zika, Zika virus. virus um, that uh, um, ha has been coming up from South America, has certainly been making the news, but then there's also um, all kinds of other, um, other types of diseases that I know you oh, know more sure. about than I do. So yeah. tell us how we're monitoring these types of things. Well, I think it's, it's important for our community to understand that public health's mission 
is to keep people healthy by preventing the spread of infectious diseases. So that's our role. And we have staff, individuals who are, shall we say, trained epidemiologists that actually monitor for uh, disease outbreaks. And we, uh, we accurately collect information, we analyze it, and then we make sure that we disseminate that information to all of our partners to where they understand the, kind of the scope of what an outbreak may be. And so we constantly provide that type of information to our healthcare providers, whether it's our hospital systems or our private physicians. Um, the media oftentimes will be interested in that information, and we share that information with other health departments as well. That's great. Um, I would direct our our listeners and viewers tonight to the public health website, phdmc.org. <coughs> and me. we actually have a program page on that website called Health Data and Stats. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of, of data out there and a lot of reports that we generate regarding infectious diseases. And one that comes to mind is we do a s influenza surveillance report. Um, we monitor for a multitude of what we consider reportable diseases that are required to be reported to the health department and we generate reports on those and develop trends over time as you referenced diane the the zika virus is drawing a lot of attention nationally right now and and, and for the right reasons it should be last year uh, it was ebola virus yes. that we were responding to i'm being told that we have a caller so i'm okay. going to ask you to hold that thought and sure. we'll come back to that um, yes caller you're on the air we'd like to hear your question go ahead Such an important uh, program, and uh, I'm very grateful for the guests that you have on the program. Well, um, thank you. As you said, there's been a lot in the news lately about the Zika virus, and today I noticed that President Obama is asking Congress for a large amount of money. Uh, as I understand it, uh, this virus and others, like the dengue virus, are spread by mosquitoes. And uh, I heard the dean of the medical school uh, at Columbia University describe uh, mosquitoes as the most dangerous animal uh, in the world. And um, as I also understand it, uh, the effort to combat uh, mosquitoes that might bear such viruses uh, has to be local. These are local solutions if they're going to be found at all. So I am calling because I wanted to hear about local efforts uh, in the Miami Valley um, to deal with the possibility that these mosquito-borne viruses may be coming our way. Thank you very much, caller. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get that answer to that question for you. I'm just going to repeat it because I'm not sure. sure other viewers could hear it, but basically he was calling uh, concerned about the local control of mosquitoes because mm -hmm. we don't, um, I mean, in many ways we have National Weather Service to that, but I'm not aware of any national mosquito <laughs> prevention program. It's a local yeah. issue that we have to take care of. So sure. talk to us a little so, bit about that and address his question, please. So there are some actions that that the health department takes to control mosquitoes and then there are actions that individuals can take to protect themselves from being exposed and bitten. So obviously we, we conduct what we call mosquito surveillance or mosquito trapping at, at certain locations within Montgomery County and we send those samples to the Ohio Department of Health lab and they're analyzed and then we, we track uh, certain diseases associated with mosquitoes. Right now it's West Nile virus that you've probably heard of before yes, yes. and certain other uh, uh, viruses similar to, to West Nile. Uh, we are not currently um, sampling um, well there's no mosquitoes there right now but in the event that this coming spring and early summer 
if we continue to see this escalation nationally and, and globally, it may be that we start submitting samples to the Ohio Department of Health for analysis for, for Zika virus as well, but that, that's not in place yet. Um, as far as other control measures, public health actively then does spraying in certain communities. We have agreements in place with certain jurisdictions where we do spraying, spraying for mosquito control. And then we do a lot of education in the community in terms of pamphlets and brochures, and it's on our web page and social media page in terms of actions that individuals can take to prevent exposure from being bitten. So things like uh, obviously use insect repellent when you're outdoors during mosquito season. Uh, wear long sleeves and long pants and a hat, which it's tough to do when that's <laughs> 95 degrees outdoors, yeah. but you really want to try to, to minimize uh, your exposure to, to mosquito bites in general. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's all very uh, important. Do we find um, uh, the, that the, the spraying and uh, is really keeping our mosquito population, uh, how is it effective? How do you judge its effectiveness? Yeah, I mean, it's I, like, you know. <laughs> I think it depends on where you are because some individuals say, oh boy, they were terrible last night. And other individuals, well, I sat out on our deck and we don't even, you know, you don't even notice anything. So it, the key is to avoid stagnant water. Right. So if there are areas where you know there's wa standing water that's stagnant, you, you want to eliminate that because that allows the larval stage of that mosquito to develop and, and then you can have problems. So, so the, that goes also out just to, to homeowners and our apartment dwellers. If they have something sitting around sure. that's got water, it should be emptied out emptied and kept out. dry. You know, if, and if it's not a moving fountain or something that's ornate in your yard, you should right. empty it out. Right. Okay. All right, good, mm -hmm. good. Thank you very much. Um, did the caller might have also mentioned that Thotha had the impression from some report he had heard that the mosquito was the most dangerous uh, carrier animal. Would you agree with well, that? Well, certainly or do you want many to? diseases uh, from a historical perspective have been spread by the mosquito vector. So yeah. um, public health interventions over time have focused on on eliminating those type of diseases through mosquito control. Okay. No question, it's very important. All right. And uh, you know, the caller also referenced what type of, you know, what, what solutions are we adopting here, here locally within our county? And I think to answer that question, we kind of need to go back to what Mr. Jordan was saying regarding an all hazards approach to our planning. So for example, we have a variety of plans in place, but it, it really doesn't matter, matter whether it's for pandemic influenza or Ebola or Zika virus. It's a common template that we're using with, with common components in that planning that engage all of our system of partners to where um, we have common plans, we do training and exercising together, and then we evaluate those plans after the fact and, and do our corrective action plans to where we can learn from, from our mistakes and what our shortcomings are. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's very yeah. good. Did, did you have anything else to add about no, that I particular? Think, okay. I think all, all right. Very good. Um, I, you've mentioned uh, your website, which is a real treasure wealth mm -hmm. of information uh, for people who are seeking for about this. Um, um, what are some other ways, because people have to go to websites, and many of us do, but some, maybe some other people are busy and hadn't gotten to that. What are some of the other ways that you all use to get information out to, uh, to people about how to protect themselves, like from okay. disease or, uh, you've already mm -hmm. mentioned the radio, but how do you get that out without, you know, this fine line, you don't want to make people panic, but right. you want to get information out. you want to inform out. the public. Yeah, yeah sure. exactly. And so, We've become, we're a very advanced state of the communication age and it seems like most individuals are very savvy about searching the internet and finding information, but not everyone wants to do that. So uh, individuals can always call our public health information line. 225-5700 and our staff can provide resources and materials to individuals if they don't want to search the internet. Mm -hmm. So, Good, good. Is there anything more to add that we should say about the template that uh, our viewers might should know? I don't know. I mean, I think our, our plan, we've been doing this planning as a, as a, as a system of partners for over a decade now. Mm -hmm. And this planning really started following the World Trade Center attacks in 2001 and then the subsequent anthrax, 
anti-anthrax attacks that occurred in this country. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working with our public safety forces, mm -hmm. our hospital system partners, uh, universities, and volunteer organizations to, to do this type of robust planning that's an all hazards approach because we're there's a lot of attention right now with Zika virus, but it may turn out that we do not experience any major outbreak or epidemic in this country. We don't know, and we don't even want to try to speculate. But we know that if we use an all-hazards type approach, the planning will be effective whether it's Zika virus, Ebola virus, influenza, or a natural disaster. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, do, do we feel that in the event of a real serious outbreak of any type of disease, then many entities are going to be seeking to get the same either vaccines or treatments or whatever all at one sure, time. Sure. And that must be a, a difficult thing to think about, that when every county needs sure. this for their citizenry, what kind, of, what kind of system do we have set up to um, ensure that it can be produced fast enough and distributed or yeah. Talk to us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, as an example, in 2009, with the H1N1 influenza pandemic, mm -hmm. obviously when that pandemic began, um, we did not have as a country a stockpile of vaccine, and it took some time for that vaccine to be, de to be developed. Mm -hmm. That allowed communities then to do a lot of planning real quickly uh, on how they would distribute uh, and administer that vaccine to the public once it was available. But to answer your question very succinctly, we didn't receive as a community, nor did any other community in this country, receive vaccine in a quantity that would cover our entire population if they wanted the vaccine. So there were target populations that were identified based on risk mm -hmm. by, the, by the federal government. And then the Ohio Department of Health issued standing orders for health departments who received the vaccine. And we had to focus initially on those high risk target populations. But the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention maintains what's called a strategic national stockpile. It's an inventory of certain medical supplies and equipment that then can be readily disseminated to requesting communities as local resources are exhausted. Okay. All right, good. So there, there is kind of a backup there going yeah. on with this with Center for Disease Control. Great. Let's uh, shift a little bit and let's talk about when, um, when sometimes the, our concerns uh, for individual health and well-being are an example of, uh, of an entity that's neglecting their responsibility. Okay. And I think what's hot in the news right now so much is the terrible problem that's happening in Flint. Uh, with the lead uh, through the water system going out uh, to all uh, all the residents who drink tap water and, and use and, and use tap water. So who is it in our area that is providing this kind of monitoring uh, one jurisdiction with another to make sure that um, uh, that that we are protected uh, from any breakdown in that regard? Do you want me to start? You start. I'll start. So from, a, from an air pollution control standpoint, uh, the health department, we, we have a, a regional air pollution control agency that monitors the air quality within a six county area. Um, we also, from a water standpoint, we, have, we are responsible for uh, private wells uh, regulations as well as septic system regulations. Uh, the Ohio EPA actually monitors the, the public water supply, but for private wells and septic systems, it, it's Public Health Dayton in Montgomery County. And then we are actively involved with the City of Dayton's well field protection program in terms of, of monitoring there as well. So I guess to back up to, ask, to answer your question about neglect of responsibility, um, that really never comes into play with us because we take our jobs very seriously. Performance expectations for our health department and all of our employees are set by our executive team and our board of health for Montgomery County. And we, it, 
we don't just establish guiding principles to guide our actions and put them on a piece of paper because they look nice in writing. We live by those guiding principles and those guiding principles mean that we're prevention based, we're centered on the community, mean, meaning we do everything we can to improve the health of our community and the 534,000 residents who live in Montgomery County. And we're accountable. We are accountable to all of our funders and to our stakeholders and to our citizens because we are in large part a taxpayer funded organization. So we're centered on community, we're focused on prevention, and we're accountable to the citizens we serve and we take that responsibility very seriously. Good, yes, go ahead. Well, in, uh, in much the same way, um, we are actually, the emergency management system in Montgomery County undergoes a review by the state emergency management agency, the Ohio EMA, uh, annually. So every year, various aspects of the system are reviewed and we must uh, provide documentation of what we have been doing and, and how we are progressing and the standard, standards we are maintaining. And then every four years, we undergo a comprehensive, real, real drill down on the system. And that's not just our office, that is the entire system. Because our office is really uh, just one, one relatively small piece of it. Um, it is um, public health, um, Red Cross, the hospitals, and of course, our emergency responders, fire and police, which are really the backbone. And so every four years, the connections, the protocols, the procedures by which we coordinate uh, a response to a large event undergo a thorough review by the state and in that way we're able to ensure we're maintaining our standards. Okay, so you have um, ongoing reviews and then every four years a very serious review where every component of the system yeah. is looked at. And it's very similar for public health's environmental mm -hmm. protection programs for air and water. We are funded by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. We receive funds from the, uh, the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. And then we also have funding through the Human Services Levy Council for mm -hmm. our environmental protection programs. And there's ongoing monitoring and review by all of those organizations to, to make sure that our programs are operating efficiently and effectively. Good. And how exactly is the air quality monitored? How does that happen? So we have a series of ambient monitoring networks, or we should say outdoor monitoring networks throughout uh, our Air Pollution Control Agency's six county jurisdiction. Okay. So we monitor for uh, national pollutants that are part of a national monitoring network, and those include ozone, um, uh, particulate matter, and things like that. So we, have, we actually operate a, a fairly extensive monitoring network, and we have technicians that do real-time data capture and, and report that information back to, uh, to the Ohio EPA. So it's and the coming in EPA. all the time. Absolutely. There's all the time yeah. it's being monitored. That's, that's, really, that's really good yeah. to know. Um, and uh, I think you've probably dealt with it, this question that I, I had already about multiple checkpoints. And it seems mm -hmm. like with the review of your partners and the other agencies that you've talked about, that there are multiple checkpoints um, for these, these life important <laughs> sources of water and air. And, you know. there, are, there are multiple checkpoints, yeah. but it's also incumbent upon us as individuals employed at the health department to to, we don't just do that to pass those audits and uh, comply with that monitoring. Mm -hmm. We strive for continuous quality improvement. And so we want to know when we're not doing something well and we want to look, we don't want to we don't want to place blame on anyone, but we want to look at processes and procedures to continually improve. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. All right, um, hazardous accidents, where I had the next on my list, and again, that can come from any kind of source, uh, as you all know better than I do, and you mm -hmm. plan and monitor for these uh, types of things. Um, we've had, um, you know, we've heard of trains spilling and then all the things that they might have on it going off into the air in various places of the country and people having to be evacuated from their homes. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the role of your agency and then how you work with your partners in the event of, of those kind of hazardous accidents that sure. can happen. Well, our primary responsibility is to maintain the county's hazardous materials emergency response plan. Okay. which is the blueprint for 
again, dealing with essentially what are industrial accidents. So it could be uh, transportation on the highway, mm -hmm. it could be a rail car, as you mentioned, or it could be a fixed facility, an industrial plant that releases a hazardous material. Um, our partners in that are, uh, first and foremost, the Dayton Regional Hazardous Materials Response Team, which is one of the premier um, response hazmat teams in the state, if not the country. It is a type one team, which is the highest rating um, a hazmat team can receive. Um, and they are made up of firefighters from throughout the county. Um, the backbone of the hazmat team comes from the Dayton Fire Department. They do an incredible job of maintaining the equipment and the training and most importantly responding to hazmat events. Denny Bristow is the hazmat coordinator um, in this county and has been for a number of years. He, he, the hazmat team uh, is also for Greene County, so it's a two county, Montgomery and Greene County. Um, as I mentioned, the fire department uh, and the fire service in general is the backbone of any kind of response of that nature, but also public health, um, Ohio and the US EPA, uh, and even RTA, um, because when it comes right down to it, um, all those agencies um, need to and have all worked together uh, to respond to those kind of releases. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, how is uh, when is a how do the first how do the first responders protect themselves in these situations? Well, the hazmat team. We wears, don't want to lose them. <laughs> no, not at all. And, um, the hazmat team uh, wears what are called uh, level A suits for the most uh, dangerous environments, and they will go into an environment that is is quite dangerous, particularly if there's somebody in there. Uh, life safety issue that comes first to get those people out, and they really kind of look like moon suits. They're mm -hmm. they're all they're all enclo enclosing, and they have their own air supplies, and and the uh, the donning of that equipment, um, the decontamination when they come out, uh, the safety uh, for the teams while they're in there, because just wearing that equipment is very physically mm -hmm. um, stressful. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that they train on on a regular basis. Um, every year we have a functional exercise where we, we uh, simulate um, actually going into a facility and then every three years, including this year, we have a full-scale exercise where not only do we test the role of the HAZMAT team, but we also look at um, shelters that would need to be set up by Red Cross, transportation by RTA, um, the opening of the Emergency Operations Center to coordinate communication. Um, it's, it's a really uh, large undertaking. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. like it. Uh, we'll come back to that, but I'm being told that there's another caller. So I'd like to inform the caller that we'd, we'd like to hear your question. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, yes. Thank you for your, this evening's program. Um, I, in light of recent uh, water emergencies around the United States, I wanted to ask a question regarding Dayton's various sources of water and uh, what the county is doing um, to do what the county is doing to help ensure that none of them become contaminated and spread to other sources. Um, thank you very much again for your program. Uh, any information will help. Thanks. Well, thank you for your call. We appreciate that, and we will we will uh, visit that uh, question then. Um, our sources of water, and we've talked a little bit about protection, but I'd like to hear from each of you um, what you'd like to comment for this caller. Well, certainly the City of Dayton's Source Water Protection Program is in place and has been in place for many years to protect our uh, the water coming from our natural aquifer uh, that supplies a significant number of, uh, of our jurisdictions within right. Montgomery County. Uh, that's a plan that's routinely reviewed and 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 monitored. Uh, public health plays a role in making sure that that all of the businesses that are located within that well field protection area area are inspected and and are in compliance. And so it's a very comprehensive plan that's in place um, that um, we're actively involved with. Okay. Yeah. Anything else to add? To well, the, uh, the Montgomery Green County Local Emergency Response Council, known as McGlurk. 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 Okay. <laughs> Great acronym, right? Yes, it is. Um, it's representatives from government and industry um, that deal with hazardous materials and, and ex what we call extremely hazardous substances. And one of their response, and, and one of uh, the organizations that are represented on that committee 
are both the Montgomery County Environmental Services, which is uh, the Water Department, and the City of Dayton Water Department. And one of the priorities in our planning and in the um, programs uh, conducted by McGlurk is to ensure that uh, the, the uh, well fields are protected, uh, mm -hmm. particularly from the release of hazardous materials. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're out there monitoring the water as well. They're checking for it. Well, the water departments do their own water. The, monitoring. the monitoring. Um, the um, McGlurk, one of their things is to develop plans to ensure that should there be a release, the well fields can be protected. Okay. Mm -hmm. We hope there's not a release, but <laughs> yes. Um, and let me also ask, are you all informed when um, something that is particularly hazardous is traveling through our area? Is, is, there, is there a way in which somebody gets a permit or a permission or lets you all know that a train or a truck or something that's coming through has something that is particularly of concern? Um, at this point, there, particularly for the hazardous materials, mm -hmm. um, chemicals that come through the county, there is not. There has been some discussion recently about uh, developing a system that would, uh, that would alert counties as to what is traveling through. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a substantially uh, significant undertaking to mm -hmm. do that. Um, it would not be all that different than what we do with the fixed facilities where we do know what is in each of the industrial sites. Uh, if they meet the threshold levels. Um, and so there's, there has been discussions uh, even at the national level uh, for developing a system like that and we've been involved in those discussions and certainly would support that effort. Okay, and so we do know what is what is already here. We, I mean, that that is inventoried somehow. Is that Correct. Who, who keeps that? Again, that is, that is the role of McGlurk. Okay. Um, and our office um, acts as the administrators of, uh, of McGlurk. I'm the chairman and mm -hmm. And one of my staff is the information officer and his uh, information coordinator and his role is to receive what we call tier two reports in which we get the inventories of the hazardous materials that are stored. Okay. And do you ever have cause to recommend that they be removed? Well, everything, as long as everything is done within the, um, within the parameters mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the regulations, mm -hmm. um, also, uh, another um, part of McGlurk is the emergency coordinator, and it's not uncommon, again, that's Denny Bristow, and it's not uncommon for Denny to go out and we'll do inspections, uh, and, and inspection is not quite the right word, because it's a cooperative, it, it, you know, we're not an enforcement agency, mm -hmm. um, but we'll go out and uh, do a survey of the site and, uh, and, and work with them to make sure the safety standards are maintained. All right. Thank you very much mm -hmm. on that. Um, I, uh, I do want to, uh, to just ask uh, briefly about um, the monitoring and what your roles are in, uh, in monitoring or your part to play with respect to, um, to any kind of terrorist activity. How do you all swing into action or would you? I mean, you have the, you have the comprehensive plan yeah. and these things are very unpredictable, but uh, just talk to us a little bit about um, su such events. Or so, possible events. So as we've talked previously, um, we continue to develop these all hazard type, uh, all hazards type plans because that allows us to respond as a community, whether it's a terrorism incident mm -hmm. or an emerging inf infectious disease such as Zika or a naturally occurring accident. And so certainly in a true terrorism related incident, it would not be this community responding alone. Mm -hmm. It would be considered an incident of national significance and we would quickly <laughs> be engaged with state, regional state, as well as federal response partners. So that's very encouraging that mm -hmm. we would have many resources come to bear to help us respond to that type of incident. We have been preparing though for whether it's a biological terrorism incident, a chemical terrorism incident, uh, a radiation incident, explosive incident. We've been preparing for that type of response for the past decade or more. And as Jeff had re referenced, there are 
there's a, just a multitude of partners who are at the planning table, and that includes uh, health departments within our region. So we're doing this type of planning on a regional basis, not just for Montgomery County, because we recognize that incidents like that do not recognize political or jurisdictional boundaries mm -hmm. and could easily overwhelm the capacity of one particular health department or even a county. So we do this planning in, a, in an eight county region referred to as West Central Ohio. And so we have healthcare systems involved, Red Cross, emergency management organizations from the eight counties, uh, volunteer organizations, health departments, academia, we're all doing this planning together. Wonderful. We have another call to that this evening. Um, yes, caller, I'd like to hear your question. You're on the air. Hi. Um, as a new mother, um, I'm concerned by what I see happening in Flint, Michigan, and I'm wondering how we as a community can be prepared if something like that should happen here. Well, thank you very much for that question. We'll revisit, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll visit Flint, uh, the issue of protection water, one more time. <laughs> okay. Thank you for calling. Good question. Uh -huh. Do you have anything to add? I don't know. Do you have anything else to add that you... Is uh, there a way that people can test their own water? There, yes, we, and we can put some information regarding water testing on the public health website and individuals can visit that at phdmc.org. Okay. Um, we'll do that. Okay, well that, okay. Uh, that might, some people might want to avail themselves, sure. themselves of that. And Diane, if I could just follow up on Coop's point uh, earlier about terrorism. I think you really summarized um, the, the governmental, uh, the public response to that, uh, preparation for that. But the flip side is the individual. And, you know, we, you, you hear the motto, uh, see something, say something, and that's, that's extremely important. Um, obviously, law enforcement can't be everywhere, and if you see something that just looks un, unusual, out yeah. of place, um, don't hesitate to report that. Yeah, um, the law enforcement will not be offended. No, nobody's going to get annoyed. They're more than happy to check it out, and it is from those kind of reports that quite often uh, valuable information is gleaned uh, that leads to the prevention, and that's really the key, the prevention of any kind of terrorist act. Well, thank you yeah. for that uh, important addition. We appreciate that. Um, we've mentioned several times the, the plans and all of the hard work in the community that got, goes into the planning. Are, are these plans available on your websites for the public to read if they, in some format? I don't know that they're currently on our public health website, okay. but they're certainly they're, they're not private <laughs> plans yeah, per se, yeah, exactly. so if yeah. anyone wants to it's take a public look at and our, people can that's sure, it's okay. public information. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, these are pub yeah. public documents. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So anybody sure. who wants to request it, right. if they wanted Absolutely. to, can take a, look, take a look at that and see. Absolutely. Now, I, uh, we've mentioned a lot of the community partners, but we haven't really talked about all the training that goes on. And uh, I think there's probably a lot of that for us to inform the public about so our viewers can know how people are training uh, in order to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Why don't you address that? Well, I can start. All right, please. Um, so public health and our community partners, we've been doing this for many years. Um, and we're doing both county level and regional level exercises. And so we actually have staff who design and facilitate and administer those exercises. So they're very skilled at exercise design. And in the past several years, we've exercised on a variety of topics uh, that could be a natural disaster. We've exercised on a radiation incident recently. Uh, foodborne illness outbreak, just a multitude of different scenarios that, that we have tested over the past several years based on an all hazards type approach. And we, the key though to exercising is it's not really about the plan itself, it's about 
making sure that we know what each entity involved in the response is going to do and what their role is mm -hmm. and that we can count on them to, to make sure that they implement their part. So the fact that we're doing this type of planning and interaction, working together on a daily and weekly basis, it really helps in the event that we actually have to respond to an, an actual incident. So, um, you get, you, yeah. <laughs> right? you, know, you get to practice your plan. Absolutely. And the key it. for that plan then is once we do the exercise, it's important to evaluate how we acted and, and what, what went well, mm -hmm. so what our strengths were, mm -hmm. and then what are areas, well, let's just call them our weaknesses. What are our weaknesses and areas that we need to improve? And then let's put together a corrective action plan and make sure then the next time we exercise that we cover what we said we were going to do in that corrective action plan. So it's a cycle that we go through, planning, exercise, training, exercising, evaluation, corrective action, and then and so forth. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Any exercise you have that you don't expose a weakness was not a good exercise. Yeah. Um, by the very nature of it, the exercises are done in a no-fault environment. We're not trying to embarrass anybody. We're certainly not trying to be embarrassed ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want to test ourselves, and we want to find out uh, what does and what does not work. And so a yeah. good exercise is one that will, and, and that's where you want to find it. You want to find it in the exercise, not obviously in a real sure. incident. Right. Yeah. Please give our viewers an, an example, a generic example of, of an exercise where you found something that needed correction. Just try to think here. I'll okay. look at our... Um, well, I, I've, got, I've got one. This, okay. might, this might sound... Um, Just several, an example. Several years ago, we had, we had been planning. This was um, probably an 18-month planning cycle. So this was a big exercise. And it was to develop to plan for um, a power outage that takes place uh, during an ice storm. Yeah. And about six months before, four to six months before the exercise, we actually had a power outage due to an ice storm. We had yeah. the real right. event. The real it event. wasn't practice. <laughs> okay. And so this was kind of the reverse where the real event um, actually showed us some of the flaws in our exercise because you yeah. make certain assumptions. If you haven't sure. been through that before, you make certain assumptions about what's going to happen, and you prepare for what you think are going to be the most likely and the most critical functions that you are going to have to perform. And in this case, we found out the things that we thought were going to be critical were not. Okay. And the things we actually had to respond to, um, we, we, hadn't, uh, we hadn't seen coming in mm -hmm. terms of the exercise. Mm -hmm. um, but that real life event is probably the best training of all. And again, the key to planning, training, and exercise is not the individual plan itself. It's the fact that we don't create these plans in a vacuum. Yeah. We bring together all the responders that are going to be involved, and they all contribute their portion. And more importantly, they all communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, police and fire work together all the time, mm -hmm. but maybe police and public health, yeah. maybe not as much. So here, they start to build relationships. They yeah. start to build channels of communication. And so that when you are in a situation, no matter what it is, no matter how well you plan, you're going to have to adapt. You're mm -hmm. going to have to face things you had not anticipated. And it is the ability to communicate and the process for adapting and the process for responding, which is far more important than the plan, plan itself. itself yeah. And when we faced that event that, that was different than we thought, we were prepared to adapt to it and we were able to do, do a pretty good job, frankly. Well, that's great. Good. And I hope you don't have more, hope we don't have more real life <laughs> uh, situations to, uh, you exactly. know, that we, that we are going to have to go through and learn from. But it sounds like we're ready because we, you were ready for that one. And, and uh, any, any comment on what you learned through that? Well, a lot of times it's, it's the limitations of, um, or ex, uh, we have to, to understand that things need to be rationed. So okay. we, a number of different agencies might be calling on law enforcement to do something. Law enforcement will say, we'll do, we can do all of that. We just can't do it all at the same time. So let's set priorities. And a lot of times it's simply a matter of, of setting priorities and making sure those prior, priorities are understood by all the all the folks involved, so they aren't working under false assumptions. Right, and so that that what's first, second, and third is understood by those that are fourth, fifth, and sixth. Exactly. So that, yeah, yeah, so that they can understand yeah. how that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to add to that? I was just going to add that as we do this training and we implement our plans, 
It allows us to recognize how important a continuity of operations plan is for an organization, and specifically for, for public health, for example. There are certain services we provide to the community that we consider mission essential services that, that need to continue to, to occur regardless of the incident that we may be responding to. So it allows us to then not just develop our response to the actual incident, but how are we going to continue to provide essential daily operations and prioritize those mission essential services that the health department still needs to provide to our community. Right, right. Yeah. Good, great, great. Thank you very much for that. Sure. Um, let's talk about particular agreements that you have with all of, with, with all of the um, partners. Um, some are natural, some are probably through f more formalized mm -hmm. uh, agreements and it sounds like with the wide number of partners that you have that there may be very, very many um, through associations, mm -hmm. you say you partner with Green on this, and mm -hmm. you part we partner with eight counties on another mm -hmm. form of monitoring and protection. So talk a little bit about about these agreements, please. Sure. Uh, I mean, I can okay. I sure. can start from sure. a public health perspective. So from an emergency preparedness standpoint, uh, we have a, a long-standing agreement in place with approximately 20 health departments in. West Central Ohio and Southwest Ohio. So it spans the counties from Hamilton County on up through Shelby County. Mm -hmm. Roughly 20 counties, we have agreements with the local health departments in those counties that in the event of a an actual incident or event where one particular county may be quickly overwhelmed, then we would provide services and we have that agreement in place. So that would include potentially sharing nursing services mm -hmm. and or uh, environmental health services such as sanitarians and, and or supplies and equipment. So we do have those long-standing uh, agreements in place uh, among the health departments within our multiple regions. Great. And your agreements? Well, starting really at the jurisdictional level, jurisdictions have MOUs, memorandums mm -hmm. of understanding with each other um, to uh, provide mutual aid. Um, and then at the county level, the kind of the omnibus agreement, if you will, is the emergency operations plan. Because there, um, individual entities are listed within the plan. Uh, they sign off on the plan that, you know, they they're take part in the writing of the plan and they uh, sign off on participating in it. And their responsibilities are clearly defined within it as to what they can contribute if they're able in the case of an emergency. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we are part of an eight county, uh, Coop uh, mm -hmm. referenced the eight county uh, region. And so we have a, an emergency operations center management team in which emergency ma management agencies from these eight counties will come to each other's aid to help, particularly for a long duration event, mm -hmm. um, staff their emergency operations center. Um, and then ultimately we can turn to the state of Ohio and the Ohio EMA and the Ohio Emergency Operations Center uh, for assistance from them. That's great. It's very good to be able to have those backups in mm -hmm. place and you know mm -hmm. who's coming when, <laughs> sure. when they are needed. Um, let's, uh, uh, in the, the little bit of time we have left, I'd like to talk about the resources um, for citizens. You have already mentioned your very uh, valuable uh, website sure. and I'd like for you to give that again um, for viewers that may be, maybe didn't get it down the first time. Sure. The public health website is phdmc.org, Public Health Dayton, Montgomery County, dot org. Um, there are a variety of other resources available to citizens, though, and that could include ready.gov or the Red Cross. Individuals could simply search Google search and find Red Cross, and you'll find the Dayton area chapter. Um, there, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, cdc.gov, has a, a wealth of information on emergency preparedness. So individuals can go to those sites on their own or they can go to our public health website that then has links to all of those sites. And I, I would assume on one of those sites there's some information on stressing the importance of families making their own plans. Um, where, how are they going to stay connected and where are they going to go and so that each family can feel secure that they can find one another. <laughs> yeah, and so it's really about um, have a plan, make a kit, 
right. and stay informed. Okay, very yeah. good. Would you like to add anything to Well, that? again, um, like Coop said, um, Montgomery County, go to the Montgomery County website, the emergency management page, and you'll find links there to the American Red Cross and ready.gov and to public health. And again, um, if you need information, particularly, we really stress we want folks to have that emergency kit in their home, in their place of work, and in their car, particularly in the winter in their car. Um, so you can contact our office, <coughs> Montgomery me. County Office mm -hmm. of Emergency Management, or you can contact the Dayton Area Chapter of the American Red Cross, and we would be happy to provide you with very simple, clear, um, succinct instructions on how you can easily build a kit and be prepared. Oh, that's yeah. very, very good advice. Thank you. And for individuals that may not have internet access, they can still also call our public health information line at 225-5700 and we can send them information. Good. Thank you very much for giving that. Mm -hmm. Well, we have very little time left, so I'd like to offer each of you an opportunity for um, any remarks or questions and comments that I may not have already asked you. Go ahead, please. Well, again, uh, Probably always the single uh, weakest point is citizen preparedness. It's very difficult. We all live very busy lives, and it's very difficult for people to take the time to prepare for something that probably isn't going to happen tomorrow, although it could, and it may not happen for a couple years, or it may not happen for five or ten years. And so without that, with all the pressures people are under, without that um, pressing and critical um, stressor to get them to prepare, it, we understand it's, it's people aren't always ready when they need to be. But remember, in a major disaster, emergency responders may not be able to get to you immediately. They're going to be dealing with the most critical life safety issues. Uh, there can be issues of debris on the roads which make transportation difficult. So you should be prepared uh, to take care of yourself and your family and your neighbors for um, for up to three days. And again, that's where that kit comes in, that plan comes in. Uh, you may want to look into some volunteer opportunities. Um, always the American Red Cross is looking for volunteers. Uh, your community may have, or a neighboring community may have a community emergency response team program, which is a great way, number one, to get prepared yourself. It's also a good way to, to work with others to help neighbors in your community uh, should there be a disaster. Oh, thank you. That's very good advice for our viewers. Thank you. And I would just add that um, public health as well as our other community partners have, have been doing this type of planning for many years as, we, as we've indicated earlier. And um, that planning allows us to respond to a, a wide spectrum of events and incidents, both routine and non-routine, to better serve the citizens uh, who call Montgomery County home. Those partners include our hospital systems, emergency management, Red Cross universities, community-based organizations, public safety forces, health departments. Each of those entities has a critical role to play because our success is going to be dependent upon the combined efforts of those organizations. And the reason we plan, train, and exercise together is to make sure that we have a coordinated response if we actually have to respond. That could be as simple as a foodborne illness outbreak. For example, several years ago we had a, a foodborne illness outbreak in the Germantown area due to a, a, a carry-in picnic. Uh, it could be uh, a TB clinic that we would have to open as a result of someone potentially being exposed to a TB patient. Um, it could be uh, in response to Ebola uh, this past year where we actually monitored travelers returning from affected countries and then perhaps the best example regarding the need for this type of planning and training together is the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic uh, which really demonstrated our ability as a system of providers to protect our residents and get them the vaccines that they needed so uh, we take this we take this responsibility very seriously and that's very clear and thank you very much okay. for doing that I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning into the program and I'd like to thank our callers and most importantly I'd like to thank my guest Jeff Cooper who is our health commissioner and Jeff Jordan who's our director of emergency management thank you again and good night thank you